Welcome to Clackamas United Church of Christ, as we like to say here in the UCC. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And tonight, I am so excited because we have Rabbi Ariel Stone with us. Everybody give it up for Rabbi Ariel Stone. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Awesome. We decided that we would just make this really conversational, like uh, two old friends hanging out, having a conversation about um, Judaism and uh, the present state of the world. So I have about nine, ten questions. I asked Rabbi Stone, um, I don't know, we started this conversation ten, no, like, like a month ago, a month and a half ago over email, uh, just asking you to come. And... Um, that was just after Pittsburgh happened, and um, we were all, I don't know, uh, devastated, struck by it, wondering what we could do, and so we just got this sign, and we said, we stand with our Jewish friends, and I was like, we have to do so much more than just put a message up on a sign, and so I wanted to reach out to you, and little did I know that you are the recipient of the 2018 City of Portland Human Rights Lifetime Award winner. Lifetime. That's kind of a big deal. Nicely done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just an honor to have you here. And um, I have these questions, but um, I wanted to ask you, uh, kind of to tell us about yourself and where you're from um, and your synagogue, uh, Congregation Shir Tikva, and what do those words mean and how did you become the rabbi there and that kind of thing. In Jewish tradition, when you're trying to say a lot in a few minutes, you say on one foot, which is a little bit like saying in a nutshell. The on one foot idea comes from uh, an old story in which someone came to a rabbi once upon a time and said, tell me all of Judaism in the time that it, while I can stand on one foot. And the rabbi said, do not do to someone else that which is hateful to you. That's the kernel of it. All the rest is commentary, go and study it. And so I would start sort of indirectly answering your question by saying that it's wonderful for me to be here because I believe that at the, the root of it, all of us are human beings first. And all the rest is commentary. All the rest is what town did you grow up in and what did your parents teach you about you know, which way to walk or which way to make your favorite food. and. So much of it narrows down our sense of who we are into a specific, right? And even among Jews, there are many different subcultures with different specifics. So some Jews on Passover won't eat rice, and for other Jews, it's a basic foodstuff. So it depends on where you come from and what you're used to. I'm from the South. I grew up with grits. I grew up with a drawl. I grew up in one of the most intensely, awfully segregated cities in the United States, Orlando, Florida. If you don't know about why so many African Americans in our country moved north in what's called the Great Migration, go find a book called The Warmth of Other Suns. It's where I learned more specifics about why people left my hometown. And I don't blame them. I would have left too. As a matter of fact, it wasn't all that easy to be a Jew there. The nice thing about being Jewish for some of us is that although there are Jews of color, a lot of us are light-skinned enough that we can pass. And so imagine our surprise after 40, 50, 60 years of thinking we'd pretty much managed to blend in when it turns out that we... Our privilege in the society is conditional. So growing up in the South, I knew a little bit about hierarchy and a little bit about discrimination. And I guess I could say that I did grow up with a certain sense of my difference 
uh, in some pretty clear ways. In the South, one of the basic food groups is pork. And since Jews don't eat it, you, you were constantly feeling different, even though you were meant to feel all together every time the school had a picnic. Um, so you want your kid to go to the same school so that everybody can know each other. Because one of the things that really hurts us is when we don't know each other. And so when I went to school in a number of places, I went to school in first Atlanta, Georgia, more of the same, only more so. Uh, but then I was in school in Jerusalem and in New York. I've worked in Ukraine. I've worked in, uh, obviously, also Portland, Oregon. And I've been fascinated by the ways in which larger cities, and I'm going to now count Portland in it because with enough will, we can do this, larger cities with diverse enough populations that actually reach out to each other and say, tell me your story, and I'll tell you mine, are so much better off than when we stay in our little gated communities in our comfort zone. In Israel, a wall has been built, which is supposed to be a security wall between the Israeli state, which is more or less defined, and the Palestinian state, which is going to happen. For the time being, it's a long time of mourning, but it's going to happen. And interestingly enough, the wall that was created sort of kind of defined it. But what has happened because of that wall is that Israelis and Palestinians know each other less, and that makes making peace harder. I'm so happy to be able to be here just in case you never met a Jew before, or just in case you never met a rabbi before, or just in case you met a Jew but didn't really feel like you could say, could you tell me more about you? I'm here tonight to thank you for your support, to tell you that, you know, I, I've run a long road from little old Orlando, Florida to get all the way out here, and I'm very grateful to be here, very grateful for all the things I've learned along my way. My congregation is the only east side congregation, so thank God at least I didn't have to cross the river. It could have been worse. Yeah? We're the only east side Jewish congregation. Most people think, including the Jews, think that all the Jews are on the west side. You know, the Jewish community center is over there. Several synagogues are over there. Wouldn't you know, you just have to look. And people you don't expect are actually your neighbors. And... So my congregation, which was started in 2002, has 180 families, give or take. And we are very proudly an open and affirming congregation, which welcomes people of all backgrounds, of all uh, diverse genders and identifications. And no matter where you come from, if it's the Jewish path you want to follow, you're welcome with us. And we have a gloriously rainbow coalition kind of congregation. I've been there for, oh my goodness, 15 or 16 years now, which just shocks me because I've never been that long in any one place. Uh, but I feel like Portland is a really wonderful place. It's got a lot of potential. It reminds me a little bit of Orlando in terms of the, its background, which is pretty, pretty solidly discriminatory. Uh, but I like trying to, let's put it this way. In Oregon, there aren't that many people. I can be a bigger fish. I can splash more. I can feel like I'm making more of, a, of an effect in the work I want to do, which is to try to meet everybody as human beings. So I'm very glad to be able to be here and to answer questions and to hopefully uh, help us all get to know each other better. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a, this isn't fair of me. You, you talked about um, like uh, standing on one foot Right, and uh, part of many of these questions, I feel just yes, just are not fair because they would they're like a course that that we should be having. And uh, so, um, you have a YouTube video that that you didn't know was up, and that I saw it, and I sent it to you, and I said this is so fantastic. And um, one of the things that I really loved about that video is that you talk about the Jewish path, which you mentioned. And one of the things that often happens in uh, interreligious dialogue is that we end up just talking about like um, what we're what makes us similar, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's great, but it, it's not 
deep enough for me, <laughs> right? So in that video, you talk about the Jewish path, the specifically Jewish path, and being a rabbi, and what is it that uh, Judaism has to offer. And if you go deeper into your tradition, uh, you're stronger. And what, what is it about Judaism that, um, when you go down the path, makes you stronger, so that when you reach out your hand, you're strong, you have a strong hand to help people. So you can't introduce yourself to someone else until you know who you are, right? And so this is just a variation of that idea. So one of the really strong influences in the 20th century in the United States has been this pressure on all of us to find what we have in common and to celebrate just that. And on some very animal level, that's where we all feel safest, when we all know that we are the same. There's a very deep-seated fear of being different in a way that will make everybody else push you away. And you know, I actually heard once, I don't know if this is true, but I think this is fascinating, that the fear of public speaking is somehow related to the fact that in the ancient world, if you were apart from everybody else, standing in front of everybody else, the only reason was because they were about to either stone you to death or put you on an ice floe and send you away. It was never good to be separate from the rest of the group. So there's a real strong sense that we all want to have something in common with each other and to feel secure in that. And it makes it really hard for us to actually be different. If you look at some of the most brilliant campaigns in marketing, they assure you that you're going to be unique if you buy the very same sneakers as 200 million other people or the same jeans or whatever it is. And that's how you're going to be you, right? So one of the interesting things about being part of a minority is that you're sort of forced into a sense of, well, who are you? Everyone else says you're different. Well, how do you define that? How are you different? How are you similar? And it takes some doing to get over the sense of fear that you're being pointed out as different and start to live in the power of that and I'll give you an interesting example out of totally left field. I lived in Ukraine right after the fall of the Soviet Union. The average citizen of the Soviet Union was now a former Soviet citizen. Their whole basis for their identity had just collapsed. I was there working with the Jewish community, which was just beginning to redevelop itself because to be religious in the Soviet Union was not acceptable. Jewish, specific Jewish practices were against the law. You could go to jail for teaching someone Hebrew. Difference was illegal on some level. Everyone was supposed to be Soviet. And then the Soviet Union collapsed. And the Jews at least had a fallback identity. So did the Khazars, so did anybody else who was a distinct people within the Soviet empire. The thing about a specific identity is that it can enrich everything you do. Jews who are deeply Jewish in their practice only seem weird from the outside. On the inside, everything we're doing makes sense to us and is woven into everything else and gives us one whole beautiful way to look at the whole world and how to deal with everything that happens to us. Yeah, from the outside it may look strange. Why do you not eat certain things? But other things that we do are not that unusual. We pray on a certain day, you pray on a certain day. We actually, <laughs> surprise, traditional Jews pray every day. But yes, we pray differently on our Sabbath, what we call in Hebrew Shabbat. If you use the word Sabbath, you are translating it into English from the Hebrew. By the way, hallelujah is also a Hebrew word. Praise God. Hallelujah. Right? So we have a lot in common here because in a way, no matter where Christians have gone, we're the mothership. And so it's kind of fun for us to look at you and say, look, look at where they've gone. That's a really good idea. I like that. You know, what I love is the UCC came up with this marvelous slogan a couple of years ago, God is still speaking, question, uh, comma. I'm like, that is so Jewish. And it's so great. 
One of the things we share is an idea that revelation is still unfolding. The thing I love best about my understanding of Judaism, and as a rabbi, I get to <laughs> dig in a lot and share this with a lot of people, and it's a delight for me. For Jews, Mount Sinai is only the beginning, and revelation is like a rose which starts as a bud and begins to open. And the more it opens, the more you see the beauty and the many petals. And the more it opens, the more you see things you never saw at the beginning because you can only see them over time. So revelation is not a truth you learn at the beginning any more than life is a truth that you have at the beginning. Over the course of your life, over the course of a people's life, over the course of a religious tradition, it develops and gets deeper and more beautiful and just continues to open and get more complex. So the ongoing journey of exploration, of the delight in the things you're discovering, recognizing that somehow you knew the seed of it, but now it's this whole thing, never ends. The way Jews get into this, even though I believe that that's a, a, a commonality, the way Jews get into it is our particular take. Everyone with their own tradition has a discrete, specific path. It's no more or less innocuous, or I should say it the opposite way, it's no more or less significant than you deciding what you're going to wear on some given day, possibly, or the language you grew up speaking. Those things are specifics. You can't wear all colors every day. You have to make a choice, right? In the same way, you, your feet are on one path. There are many mountains. They all reach for the sky. We each happen to be on our own mountain of religious tradition. They are all beautiful. They are all good. There's this term, I don't know, you may, have, you may know who came up with it, but it's religious envy. Oh. And there are, times, there are times when I'm in the presence of another religious person, leader, or whoever, and I'm like, oh man, that's awesome. I'm envy that's, that's cool, that's really cool. So um, thank you for that, that was awesome. Uh, we wanted to do this in December because we both have a tradition of lighting up the darkness that is in December. Uh, you have Hanukkah, and we have Advent and Christmas. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Hanukkah and where that comes from and why it's significant for you. Hanukkah is, uh, the word Hanukkah comes from the word dedication. And therefore, the holiday is actually really all about the fact that during the Greek occupation, you remember Alexander the Great? You remember how he took over the world and then he died, bang, young. And his three generals kind of divvy up the world. So Israel is in the, in the middle third. And so the Jewish people are occupied by this great Greek civilization and they make Jerusalem into a polis, right? It's really fascinating actually. Turn, and, and, Frankly, the average Jew thinks that the Greek culture is pretty cool. It's not a whole lot different from being part of American culture. You can go anywhere in the world and people are wearing American t-shirts and aping American ideas and American culture because it's so cool. Maybe a little less now in the last 20 years. But uh, it, it's, it's generally been true for a long time. American culture is pervasive in the world. And in the ancient world, it was Greek culture, Roman culture, Egyptian culture that had exactly the same effect. So the Greek empire encompasses this entire area of what's called the ancient Near East. Among them is the Jewish state, the Jewish kingdom. And the Jews, some of them are really enjoying Greek culture to the extent that they're throwing off all kinds of distinctive Jewish practices and adopting the Greek way of being. They're learning to speak Greek. They're learning to look down on their fellow Jews and say, if you don't speak Greek, you're not cool. Uh, they're learning to love the Greek equivalent of the BLT. 
They're learning to uh, speak Zeus and Aphrodite, you know, all the cool things the Greeks are doing. Some men are having their circumcisions reversed. You heard me. Because they want to wrestle naked in the gymnasium with the other Greeks. I'm telling you. The, the, if you think about the, the lengths that we will go to to be in the cool culture, it's very often somewhat painful. So the story of Hanukkah, fascinatingly enough, is actually mostly about Jews having a, a, a tremendously acrimonious dispute among themselves about how Greek can you be before you're not a Jew anymore. So for Jews and in the United States today, it's not, uh, it not at all without its resonance because there are Jews who are very happy being American. There, I can't remember what the article, oh, I do remember what the article was. There was something in the New York Times about being Jewish and meaning. And the New York Times is like way too full of Jewish stuff. It's weird. Um, and then there were some responses in the letters section the following week, and one of them was, well, you seem to think that every Jew has to have some connection to Jewish religion. I'm here to tell you I have none, and I'm a perfectly good Jew being an American. I don't even need to call myself a Jewish American. I'm just an American. There are Jews who are completely convinced that they can just blend in and be happy. We'll see about that. Anyway, some Greek some Jews wanted to be all Greek all the time. Some Jews said, that way lies disaster. We will cease to exist. The Greek, I don't know, overlord, the Greek border patrol, whoever it was, comes in and starts to try to lay down the law. And one of the things they did was to take over the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and install the Greek god. And the Jews who were more Jewish, not the Greek Jews, the Greek Jews are like, cool, whatever. The more reactionary Jews, the more traditional Jews were like, over our dead body. And so there ensued a guerrilla war. The few Jews managed to uh, completely flummox the Greek army. They drove them back to the extent that they were able to recapture the temple. When they went in, they found that everything had been basically trashed. They rededicated the temple. And because they couldn't do it a few months earlier, they held the festival of Sukkot as soon as they got the temple cleaned up. The festival of Sukkot, which you call tabernacles, lasts for eight days. So Hanukkah lasts for eight days. There's a coda to the story. If you talk to any Jew about Hanukkah, they'll tell you it's about a miracle of light, of oil that lasted for eight days. The original story is about Jews fighting and dying other Jews, Jews fighting and killing other Jews over the question of identity and continuity. Then, generations later, when the Romans came and they were occupying Jerusalem and the Jewish uh, kingdom, the young Jewish men, who were always hotheads, were saying, just like our ancestors managed to push back the larger army of the Greeks, we're going to push back the larger army of the Romans. We'll kick him out. God will be with us. The Jews lost three wars against Rome. According to, I don't know if it was Josephus or somebody else, but according to one contemporary account, so much Jewish blood was spilled in the third revolt against Rome that the Romans didn't have to fertilize their vineyards for five years. The temple was destroyed, and the rabbis, who at the time were a beginning, kind of just starting group of teachers who were kind of taking over from the priests because, listen, once a temple is destroyed, the priests don't have a power base. So the rabbis step in to fill a power gap, and they say, you know what, let's regroup and let's study what to do next, and you know what, let's get out of here. Let's go down the hill to Yavne, let's go to Tiberias. Let's leave Jerusalem and let's settle down for a while. And they retaught the story of Hanukkah. And we have their fingerprints all over it. They ask in the middle of the Talmud, what's Hanukkah? What a stupid question. Everyone knows what Hanukkah is. And they say, no, you don't know. What you don't know is that the real story of Hanukkah is how God created a miracle 
when we were dedicating the temple, we only had enough oil for one day that was kosher. And God made it last for eight days till we could find more. And in so doing, the way they told the story, they took the emphasis off the guerrilla army overcoming the great odds. And in so doing, they taught the Jewish people that sometimes you can't fight against superior odds. Sometimes you have to duck and cover. And that actually, once we went into exile, allowed us to survive living in hostile societies because we had learned you don't have to fight back and die. Sometimes it's okay if you just figure out how to live and maintain your customs and your tradition and your history and believe that one day things are going to get better. Um, I would just like to point out um, something that has not always been obvious but should have been, that Jesus was a Jew oh, yeah. living at around this time, and Jesus had the same, according to the Gospels, the same idea. Don't fight against the Romans. Go do something else. Yeah. I had never made that connection before. That's Awesome. Um, so, uh, in some of some of our people here um, know Judaism fairly well, and uh, some don't know it at all. So, uh, some of these questions might be a little basic. Some of them maybe not. Um, but we have in Christianity different denominations after the Protestant, especially after the Protestant uh, protest uh, Reformation. Um, does Judaism have something similar? Indeed. So in the pre-modern world, a little bit like in the pre-Reformation world, you basically have Jews more or less all recognizing each other. But there's a spectrum, right? Human nature is a spectrum. What they didn't do is call themselves groups. That's a more modern awareness. What happened to Jews is that when we hit the modern world, and this happened actually with Napoleon of all people, in France, Jews were asked, if we let you out of the ghettos, will you be loyal citizens? Now, you might think, you put me in a ghetto. Why would I be your loyal citizen? But the Jews just wanted to partake of the society. And they said, yes, we will. We'll sign up. We'll pay taxes. We'll go to war for you. Just let us be equal citizens. And that set up a bit of an issue, because if you're going to be an equal citizen, you have to be equally available. You can't go in the army and say, sorry, I don't fight on Shabbat, or sorry, I only eat kosher food. That began to set up a bit of a problem. The problem gets worse when you think about how modern society, especially capitalist societies, require you to be productive. If the majority population takes Sunday off, Nobody cares if your day is Saturday, if there's only two of you, right? You have gotta go along or you're not gonna get the job. So in the United States and in Western Europe, Jews started having to make decisions about whether they were going to tip the balance in the direction of doing the best they could in the society and making as much money as they could and being as well off as they could and assimilating as well as they could, or sticking to their traditions and being poor. To this day, you can see the result of those decisions. You can go to certain areas in any larger city where there's a lot of Jews, and you can see some Jews who are very traditional and tend to not have much money. And you can see other Jews who are more assimilated and who are just like everybody else. The real issue is an interesting one that you may be able to relate to if you've ever worried about your grandchildren and their sense of identity. It's been said that for Jews today, the question is not, were your grandparents Jewish? It's, will your grandchildren be Jewish? How, if you're not doing enough, then what will they inherit? If you're not distinctive enough, what will they know? So it's, it's very interesting because, you know, people are doing the best they can for their families, and then they find out the decisions they made when the kids were little have ramifications they couldn't even imagine. So you have Jews that are more liberal. That's how they call it. And I'm not sure exactly what that used to mean because it's not true anymore that the more a Jew looked like everybody else, the more left-wing they tended to be. 
That's absolutely not true anymore. But once upon a time, it was taken for granted that the more traditional you were, the more right-wing you were. Now, now there's a, a real shift in that. One of the things that's interesting for me in Portland is that uh, we have Jews from across the spectrum, and you can't imagine, you can't guess their politics. I think that's a really interesting phenomenon. So, for that matter, I can't guess yours, so I'm just going to throw it all out there, right? Uh, you are UCC, and we actually, my congregation shares space with the UCC church, so I think I know that you're pretty friendly, right? Uh, so, for example, there is a large reform congregation, and I guess a little bit predictably, their income is high enough that they tend to be somewhat conservative. It's not a sine qua non, but apparently there's a little bit of a statistical correlation. There's a very traditional group, the kind of people who, where the men all dress in black and wear hats and, you know, are pretty strict, or you think so, and their rabbi's a libertarian. I called him a couple days after the election, and he was devastated. I'm like, wait, you're a traditional rabbi. You were for Hillary? But then again, he's a guy who also calls me rabbi. Okay, so one of the big divisions in uh, Christianity and in Judaism is if you've got a female spiritual leader, you're definitely on one side of the spectrum that we're probably going to call the left side. There are rabbis who are women in the middle of the spectrum now, and they're starting to sneak onto the other side, just like I think in, in Christianity. Um, and the same is true with other groups that have been somewhat marginalized and nevertheless may also be speaking the word of God. Congre my congregation is independent. It's not part of any movement. The movements are very much a result of modernity. And I believe we are in a postmodern world where most people are not ideologically driven. They're driven by ethics. They're driven partially by where they're comfortable in other ways. Your shul or your synagogue or your church can't be too far away or else you're not going to get there. It's going to be too hard. You need a neighborhood place to pray and to be together with people who you can support and they can support you. You need a rabbi or a pastor that you can relate to and who can support you when you need it. And you need a critical mass. And in my congregation, all the rest of it is, are you willing to learn something you don't already know? Because for me, that's the joy. My spirituality is in learning, finding one more petal of that rose as it opens. That's fantastic. I lived in Skokie, Illinois for a while, and uh, very traditional Jews living there. And it was so, I don't know, refreshing, I think. Like, I probably would not have anything political in common with these people, uh, but they're walking in their hats and the, what are they, the, Pace. I was going to say sideburns, but that's not good. <laughs> Their pace, and I would like they would just walk to the synagogue and back, and there was something so uh, refreshing and good about doing that. Like everybody's living in the same community and walking to the same synagogue and then walking home, and it's good stuff. Yeah, um, community. Yeah, it's a good sense of community. Um, we uh, Christians on these different sides of the spectrum. Uh, um, have different understandings of the Bible. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the Bible. It's different. So uh, one of the things that I always struggle with is that we are different. And so the progressive inside of me always like goes, ah, when we call it the Old Testament. But it's, it's not the Tanakh. It's not um, the it, we could call it the Hebrew Bible, but we put it in different orders, and so it's not that. We could call it the First Testament and the Second Testament, right? But so anyway, t could you tell us about your sacred scriptures and how you interpret them? And yeah. So for us, the book is actually quite whole. It ends with Chronicles, which is a nice ending. Um, Christ the Christian order ends with Malachi, my messenger, which makes it look like you're, something else needs to happen. So yeah, there's a little bit of a, of a rearranging it. Um, you could say that that's absolutely legitimate in terms of the people who rearranged it, and that's true. And that's where we part ways. Uh, in Jewish tradition, 
here's a cool thing that's hard to grasp, even for some of my people. We don't say it's written in here and therefore it's true. Okay? For Jews, the relationship we have with the revealed word of God in our scriptures is more complex than that. Because we have made, we have emphasized the fact that God may speak, God may still be speaking, but it's human ears hearing, and we are not really good at listening. Now, I don't know about you, but if I go buy the mustard, my husband can't find it in the fridge unless I tell him where it is, right? So what makes you think you can see, right? What makes you think you can hear if what you're being told is something that you've never heard before? So revelatory words are the most difficult to hear. Our traditions started as verbal traditions, oral traditions. By the time they got written down, have you ever played telephone? So here's the thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of Josephus. He was a historian. He wrote about the Jews and the Jewish wars. He wrote about a lot of interesting stuff. He wrote about being on Masada right before it was destroyed. He wrote, uh, he very famously gave us the last speech of the leader of Masada. The funny thing is he wasn't there, okay? But what's interesting about that for me is that our version of history is not the traditional version. We have a scientific approach to history. We want to see the facts. We want to see proof of what happened. That's modern. We're totally sucked into this modern scientific bias. Our ancestors didn't believe that history could be told by one person in one way, and that was it. Okay, well, okay. well the Greeks, the Greeks come up with this binary idea that one thing is true and everything else is false. But the Jews were around before that, and we tell two stories of creation, we tell two stories of the flood, we tell at least three stories of the moment of meeting and covenant between God and the Jewish people, and that's just in the first five books. So why would you tell more than one story? Don't you want to tell the truth? Well, if you've ever been part of a passionate group experience, you know that every single person will tell that story a little differently, and it's all true. So that leads to the great Jewish joke about the rabbi who had two people come in dispute before the rabbi, and the rabbi was supposed to judge, and the rabbi listened to the first person and said, you're right, and then listened to the second person who contradicted the first person and said, you're right, and then a disciple said to the rabbi, rabbi, they're contradicting each other. How can they both be right? And the rabbi said, you're right. <laughs> Life is not only complicated, it's also contradictory. If you've ever felt two contradictory emotions at the same time, then you already know you yourself are capable of being a whole human being who is internally contradictory. The story of an entire people, how much more so? How can we come to understand that truth is adumbrated through human experience and is therefore always partial? I had a teacher, may he rest in peace, who taught that the difference between Jewish ethics and Christian ethics is the difference between be believing the Messiah has come and believing that the Messiah is still on the way. The differences between the Christian, Christian messianic ethics and the Jewish messy ethics, right? That's the way he put it. The, the issue for us is, when it comes, I'll just give you an aside about Jesus since I brought it up. Um, Jesus hits all the right notes, or at least his followers hit all the right notes in terms of fulfilling the scripture, right? These are all the things the Messiah is supposed to do, except that nobody ever created an exam for what the Messiah was supposed to do until Jesus' followers came along. If you go back and you look at the story of Elisha, he fed a multitude with a couple of loaves and fishes. Tell me another one. Elisha also raised the dead. So for me and for Jews, those things are are interesting, but they're not proving anything. For the Jewish people, it's about sort of like the way starlings all fly together in the sky, kind of sort of together, yet each one is separate. 
Jews are moving through history in that way with a sense that each one of us is holding on to a little piece of the truth in the way that each of us is part of a quilt. Each of us is a square in a bigger quilt. You're going to be awful cold by yourself. Or one thread of yarn in a bigger weave. It's not about what I know. It's about what all of us know and are willing to stake our lives on. So for us, we have the first five books that we keep in a special way because they're extra special for us. They have in it um, the ten words that aren't really ten commandments. If you go look, the first one's not a command. Ten words that were spoken or somehow understood at some point in the past. They sort of well up out of the past. After those first five books, we have another section called The Prophets. And there's everybody in there and all their adventures. Samuel. Samuel goes and finds our first king. That's a kind of a mess. Finds the second king. That's a bigger mess in some ways. King David is a mess. He's not your fine, upstanding person. Oh, that's another thing I should mention about uh, uh, what the Jews have done with our scriptures. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, all those guys, all those women, all the people that we hold up and we tell their stories, none of them are saints. It's not a lives of the saints. These are people who struggle. These are people who screw up. These are people who do things that are not good. And the power in reading their stories is not that they were such great people that we should emulate, God forbid, in some cases, but that we can recognize our own struggles in theirs, they saw their lives, as far as we can tell, as a struggle to understand who they were supposed to be, how they were supposed to be, which is just a way of saying what is God's will. And we can relate to that because we don't know what we're doing either. The second section with the prophets starts with the historical stuff, or semi-historical, and gets into the great things like Isaiah and Jeremiah. I'm quoting Isaiah all the time downtown now. Let righteousness well up as waters and justice. So Isaiah, when Isaiah said, let justice roll down like waters, he wasn't thinking about our gentle rain we get here. He was thinking about the flash floods you get in the Negev. I was living in Israel when a flash flood shot through the Negev one day, and some stupid group of people who were hiking had parked their Jeep in a dry riverbed. And when they found their Jeep, it was 10 miles down the road, upside down, full of mud, because a flash flood had come through in the meantime. If you've never looked at a flash flood on YouTube, I think they have them now. There's everything on YouTube now. So what Isaiah was saying is, let justice come and sweep everything that's an obstacle in its path away and just trash it. Just get everything out of the way, because we need justice. So you have those guys holding forth. And by the way, during their lifetimes, nobody liked them. So if you hear people complaining about demonstrations in downtown Portland, you know, just, just to quote, uh, was it Pete Seeger? No, it was Woody Guthrie. Whose side are you on? You know, just think about history. They threw Jeremiah down a well. And now we quote him all the time and talk about how great his words are. I don't want to be dead <laughs> in order to have my words appreciated, but I do believe there's something to that. The final section is what we call miscellaneous. It has psalms in it and proverbs and poor Job and Ruth and Esther, who's quite something. If you look at Esther's story, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. There's a reason why we're supposed to get tipsy the night we read that story. The Jews do every year. We get together and we pass around a couple bottles and we giggle because when you get to the point where the king holds out his scepter to the queen, and she comes forward and she touches it, and he says, anything you want, Esther. You can't help but realize the Bible's not a G-rated document. It's human beings. Song of songs, all that good stuff. We're whole human beings. In our Jewish scriptures is every experience you can possibly have. David and Jonathan, by the way, were lovers. And it's quite possible that Sarah and Hagar were lovers and, and even married, and Abraham was just the, the sperm donor. It, you know, we've been taught the story in a certain way, but there's lots more possibilities. 
And human beings didn't just start being interesting in the last 20 years. I imagine there may be some questions after that one. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, the, what is the Talmud and the Mishnah? Did I pronounce those correctly? Yeah, I did. Right. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So um, have you ever had an owner's manual for a car and you notice that uh, you get a new car or another car and it's got a different owner's manual? Well, it's the same four wheels and the same body. What's the problem? Things keep changing even if they're just little things. So the owner's manual needs to change. In the same way, once you canonize a document, once you write stuff down, it gets static. Back in the days when everything was oral, the stories we told, the stories all of us told, continued to be shaped by our experiences. But then, because of pressure of, you know, the Romans are coming and they're going to kill everybody, we better write this stuff down. For reasons like that, things got written down. It was considered to be a real tragedy to have to write these things down because you lost something when you no longer have a storyteller. Instead, you just have a text. It's interesting because we think of text as being superior to memory, but it's not. It's only the surface of the story. It's only back in the ancient, back in ancient times, messengers carried words to help them remember the text they'd memorized, an aide memoir, not the text of the message, but just prompts to help them remember the message. That's what the scriptures were in the beginning. Once they got written down, they start immediately to go a little bit out of uh, relevance. If the Torah is written for an audience of shepherds, what happens when you get urbanized? What happens when the command is, you're supposed to bring a Thanksgiving sacrifice of a sheep? but you're not a shepherd. You're a sandal maker, or you're a tanner. Should you bring a sandal? Is that the equivalent? Or should you go buy a sheep? Is that the correct thing to do? How do you know? So immediately you have to start having an interpretive class of people, rabbis, who will help you figure out how to continue to do God's will as recorded in the Torah, even though we no longer live in that way. So that's what I call job security right? And the first written down compendium of, okay, here's how you do it, is called the Mishnah. And it's not very big. It's six volumes. One volume of damages, one volume of ceremonies, one volume of, you know, all the things you need in law to live in a society. But then it was written down, and then things changed, and we needed commentary on the Mishnah so we could understand the Mishnah. And that's the Talmud, and it's 66 volumes and it didn't reach final form until the 1600s. Basically, it was people writing notes and then writing notes upon notes and writing notes upon notes upon notes, and so the books kept getting bigger because everybody was sharing the notes all over Europe. Finally, somebody printed it out and said, enough already. But you know what happened after that? Somebody had to start writing commentary on that. So the Mishnah is from about the year 500, the Talmud is at least a thousand years later, reaching its final form, and today we are still writing commentaries to continue answering the questions that have been rising up ever since. So if the Mishnah says, your cup is kosher if it is made of glass, not if it's made of uh, clay. It can contract impurity. You go to the Talmud, the Talmud says that in about four more paragraphs because life's gotten more complicated and there's more kind of material that we make cups out of. Then, these days, somebody's going to ask me, if I put it in my dishwasher, will that make it kosher? And the answer is, I can tell you, derived on the ancient, ancient principles, what the modern answer would be, but it's not because it's in the ancient principles. I have to derive it. So this business of continuing to derive new judgments is a lot like American law. You have an original statement, then you have case law and precedents, and then you keep having precedents because you keep having new cases. And it's still going on. Oh my God, is it still going on? Uh, I, I did my uh, master's thesis on Islam. And when you're talking about oral tradition, uh, it reminds me of Islam and uh, the 
some of the people that I was studying, they were saying the point is to memorize and recite. So God comes to Muhammad and says, recite. And so it's not like the, the physical book is important, but in order to get us to memorize and recite it. And there's something like really important about that because once you like recite it, for me, it's like you can't take the book and hit somebody over the head with it. You know, there's something about it that just kind of, it's ephemeral, it's like spirit, it's, it's out there. I don't know if you have a response to that or... I actually have a, a, a crazy response to that. There was a female rabbi in the Talmud. There were women teaching in the Talmud as well as men. Don't let anyone tell you different. Um, there was a woman who was teaching in the Talmud whose name was Bruria, and she came across a student who was studying reading silently. And she kicked him in the shins. And he went, ow, audibly. And she quoted him from the Psalms, ordered in, ordered in all your limbs, which was her way of saying that it won't be ordered if it isn't in all your limbs. You have to act it out. You have to feel it. You have to speak it. It has to be in your bones. Your, your life can't be in your head only. It has to be embodied. Things that matter to you are embodied. You're acting them out. They're in your bones. You know, in, in biblical language, in the Psalms, we have, you know, uh, the sadness in the kidneys, right? Or the anger in the, it, it, just different parts of you. If you look at the Psalms, it's amazing how embodied they are. Anger's in the nose. Sadness is in the kidneys. Thinking and feeling is in the heart, both of them. They didn't know what the brain was for. A little bit like the Egyptians who thought it was waste matter. <laughs> wow, that's good. Um, two, three questions, and then we'll open it up. Okay. Uh, at the bottom of your email, I noticed that you have a quote that says, uh, justice, justice shall you pursue that you may live. Uh, that's Devarim 1620. So if you tell us about that, um, and then it says in... 5,779, Shir Tikva seeks to learn and do justice without and justice within. What, so what does, and um, justice has been meaningful to you throughout your lifetime, what does justice mean in the Jewish context and what is 5,779? That's the year, right? So according to Jewish tradition, we are in the year 5,779. What's the Chinese year? But they have another calendar with a different year, right? So there's lots of different ways of counting. According to Jewish tradition, that's exactly how long it's been since, well, I guess once upon a time we believe that it was since God created the world. But the average Jew does believe that dinosaurs did exist. So we're okay with, most of us are okay with using that as a ritual way of counting that we don't have to have really mean something. Right? So it's, it's our way of counting our year, and it's our way of keeping track of spiritual time. Every year, my congregation chooses a different theme to try to, to dig into. And because of everything going on, obviously justice is a big deal. But what we learned last year is that it's really easy to go out there and, and march for justice and not be just to each other. It's much harder to practice justice on the micro level among us. So this year, what I am harping on is one of the most important values in Judaism is to assume the best of everyone. Never gossip. Never talk about anybody who isn't in the room. How's that for a rule? And always assume the best of someone. So if someone's driving you crazy, all you're allowed to say is, you know, that doesn't seem like them. I wonder if they're okay. Right? That's a really interesting exercise to try on. Uh, it goes along with the Jewish uh, teaching that nobody is uh, demonized. Everybody's just a hurting human being, no matter how odious they are. I don't think Jews invented that idea. Or I don't know, maybe we did, but I know we share it with a lot of other good people. Thank you. Um, so I, um, one of the things that's happening in the United States is a growing rise of anti-Semitism in the last, I don't know, maybe 
three, four years or two years or whatever. Uh, I was in uh, Lake, a church in Lake Oswego for a while, and there was a growing rise of anti-Semitism there, and that was like a year and a half, two years ago. Um, how is your community dealing with this, and um, what, what can people like us do to help? Thank you for that. Thank you for asking. What anti-Semitism anti is beyond our ability to um, eradicate as Jews, right? Nobody can eradicate the uh, discrimination against them. We need everybody else's help. Uh, the average Jew is doing one of two things. They are either um, becoming less visible because they're trying really desperately to stay safe and keep their children safe, or they're becoming more visible because, by God, if you're going to be uh, oppressed for being Jewish, you might as well be Jewish about it, right? So you see a certain seriousness among some Jews that perhaps you didn't see before. When I deal with an intermarried family now who's talking about becoming more Jewish, I ask them to really think carefully about it because you're making a choice which makes you more vulnerable uh, and you need to be all in. Jews are no strangers to anti-Semitism. The fact that it's uh, currently getting worse is just a cyclical thing. And if you know American history, you know it's never been that far below the surface. There are people who like to argue that it goes away and comes back. I think it's always there. It just takes different forms. I've taught college classes on anti-Semitism. It starts as Jew hatred, and then it becomes, which is a religious-based phenomenon, and then it becomes anti-Semitism, which is more a political thing. You can tell it a little bit by what Jews are being accused of in each system. So anti-Semitism it's an interesting thing for Christians to consider to what extent is it a Christian invention and to what extent is it something that Christians simply, you know, jumped on because it was an available pony at a time when Christianity was trying to differentiate itself from Judaism. It doesn't really matter which is true. The, the problem is we, we've got a mess here. One of the most important ways that Christians can help Jews is to make sure that you yourselves are not harboring any anti-Semitic tendencies. So first we look within ourselves, right? And that's the hardest part. And then we try to do the, what's considered to be the most difficult obligation of all of Judaism. There's, according to tradition, there are 613 laws in the Torah that Jews are supposed to follow. The one that's considered to be the hardest is which means you must rebuke your neighbor when your neighbor is doing wrong. Now this flies in the face of all of us who would rather not confront each other, right? You're not the boss of me, says the wrongdoer when you say, hey, you, don't stop littering or whatever. The reason it's such a hard obligation to fulfill is because you're supposed to do it in a way that doesn't make it worse. So if you go up to somebody and say, knock it off, you idiot, then they just hate you as well. That's making it worse. That's not making anything better. The really interesting question is, how do, is, is it really possible to change hearts and minds? If so, how? It's a really difficult question when we live in a place where we are so often distanced from each other. And we all know what we already believe, and you can't change me, and I can't change you. And a lot of people don't believe it's possible. But it must be possible for people to grow and say, oh, I used to think this and now I think something else and the something else is more loving. Or else why are we here if we don't believe that people can learn to love and trust? So in a way, to fight anti-Semitism right now is simply to fight for goodness for all people. And what we Jews know is that we can't just fight for ourselves. We have to fight for every marginalized and targeted community. So I would say the best thing we can do to fight anti-Semitism is not allow any negativity toward any community. And then we'll all be lifted up. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the things I know uh, inside of me, and it's probably generally true about all of us, is that I'm blind to all of the things that I've been formed by. And um, so, like, I was in a Bible study, and there's this... Um, passage about uh, 
where Jesus says and John the Baptist say that um, if you don't follow this path, the stones will cry out. And there's this uh, interpretation where um, the stones are the Gentiles and the Gentiles are going to come in. And I'm, I'm like teaching this and I'm like, oh my God, that's so anti-Semitic. And like I'm in the process of teaching it and like this thing goes off in my head and I'm like, I've been taught this from the past and uh, here it is coming out of me. And part of it is that um, I, I need that I need that other voice and friends to come up to me and rebuke me and people that I trust, as you say. So that's part of what's so important about what you just said is you um, have so you have a book. For being a friend to us and you have you have to, you have last book coming question. out. So tell us about your first book, which is because all is one, and then your next book coming out. In a very quick nutshell, on one foot, the first book is a study of Jewish mysticism and how certain insights from Jewish mysticism can help you live a more integrated and meaningful life. Now, it takes me over 400 pages to do that, but that's because it was my doctoral thesis, and everybody wants to get their doctoral thesis out there. The second book, which is about to come out, is called, uh, well, let's see. It's called The Aleph Bet of Death, which Aleph Bet is the Jewish way of saying the alphabet, and it's about how to die as a Jew. You may or may not know that during and after the bubonic plague in Europe, a book called Ars Moriendi became popular, which was the Christian art of dying. There's also a Buddhist how to die. But even though there's lots of Jewish teachings on dying, there was no book that brought them together. And so I'm writing it because I had a, a congregant and close friend who when he was dying was very peevish that there were all these books for the people who were going to be mourning but nothing for him. So I said, okay, Andy, I'll create it. And he, he couldn't wait for me. May he rest in peace. But I'm dedicating this book to him and to the other people that taught me what I needed to know so I could write it. So that, God willing, will come out sometime in 5779. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Everybody, Rabbi Ariel Stone.